I'm going to apologize ahead of time. There will be many stops and starts to this video. Um, I'm having some vertigo issues today and was not planning on recording anything. But I, in love, listened to a sermon, a church service that was given today and was moved to all kinds of emotion. And I then feel obliged to report on some corrections that need made in the minds of men. The first is quotes that were given from the Bible, which state something to the effect of God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. You guys know the rest. Okay. The correction is for God so loved his children, which is all of the world, including our planet, mind you, who is a living celestial being. So I will begin again. For God so loved his children that he sent his son who was worthy to embody on earth the eternal word, which is love. Christ came not to die for our sins. Christ came to show us that we have eternal life. He embodied the message, the word, that we might know that we are eternal. There are many misunderstandings in this. It is not by any act of our own that we are eternal. We are eternal because we were created by our infinite creator as such. The only difference is if we Listen to the message of love. We know we are eternal. We know ourselves as perfect as created by God. And then we act it. We do not lose our lives because we don't act loving or think loving. We are eternal. There is no changing that. Christ came not to save us from damnation, but to help us see that we were already saved. We never left God. The word of God is not the words written in any text. The word of God is love and the message that is communicated in the purest transmission of that. A Bible is not any better than any other religious spiritual text. They are paper. They are pages with ink on them. The word is inside of each and every one of us. These religious texts, these inspired writings can point, can assist in remembrance 
of who we are as children of God. One who reads a Bible is worth no more than one who reads any other religious text. Each of us chooses the texts, the writings, the inspirations which point to us, point to us a direction for us to remember ourselves. The knowledge is already in us because it cannot be destroyed. All of these works do is remind us of the truth that always exists. We must be very cautious that we do not set ourselves above or apart from our brothers and sisters who believe other spiritual texts. God is in them also. Are errors present in all of them? Absolutely. Because they all were penned by man. And even, even the most pure channel still has human personality. Even Christ, even Christ, if you understand his words, he has told us that he had a personality that he often had to, to limit, to discern the difference. He he had to hearken as strongly as he could to the word which he was, which I am, which you are, the word. We are love. We can be manipulated. We can be fooled. The mechanisms that have controlled and ruled this world for a long time are very powerful and each and every one of us has been touched and tainted by them. You call this sin. It is time to understand what is really going on here. If there is a sin, that sin is anything that tells you that you are better than or different than anyone else because you are not. If sin truly exists, it is anything that hides the fact that you are love in a body. If sin exists, it is anything that allows you to believe that your way of belief is right and someone else's is wrong. The absolute truth of everything is we are love incarnate in a body. Each and every one of us. If someone else can find the truth of who and what they are in God, in another religious text, they are blessed equally. No one is better than another. No faith is better than another. No faith is any more true than another. God is in them all. Because we are all in God. I will have more shortly. I must come back to this part that he sent. I'm using a patriarchal term for God, and I am comfortable doing that, and I'm sorry if you are not, but God is balanced, perfectly balanced, feminine and masculine. I am a woman. 
who loves her daddy. So I use the patriarchal term, he for God, okay? If you choose to say God is a she, God will not care. <laughs> God so loved his children that he sent his son who was worthy. What, what difference is there between the one we know as Christ and ourselves? The difference was that we have not yet achieved the level of divine filtering of energy into our human vessels as what the one we know as Jesus was able to achieve. We have blocks upon us that prohibit us from utilizing all of our abilities. We can be grateful for those blocks on some level because there are people who, if they were able to access all of those abilities, they would have used them to harm and to do unpleasant things. And so we have not been allowed to access and utilize all of our gifts for our own protection. Christ <clears throat> was worthy of those blocks not being there. The miracles that he performed were absolutely true and are absolutely possible. But they are possible by each and every one of us. If we have conditioned ourselves close enough to the alignment of true love source, we would have those abilities also. That is the only difference. He was already elevated. He already held a position that allowed him to come into human form and not be restricted in the ways that the gross majority of us are. So I just wanted to clarify that because Christ would say that we are no different than he is. That is how we know that we are not to point fingers at other religions and say they are not right and we are right. Our way is right because Christ would not do that. Christ would say, and in the Bible it is cited that Christ said, they are not my flock. And what he meant by that was not, they are not my brothers and sisters. That's not what he meant. What he meant was, they're not able to hear me right now. They are not able to receive these teachings they're not able to absorb this message. But he loved them just the same. The same. They had no less value than anyone else. More on this in a bit. I'm, I'm really sorry, guys, to anyone who is watching this video. These are, some of these things are so hard for me to speak about because I get very emotional. Through Christ, we are saved. There is this concept, through Christ, we are saved, and that is true. But it is true because through love, which is the message of Christ, through love, we know we are saved. Through love, we understand that we are that. Through love, we understand that we are that, and so is everyone else. Um, I, ha I may have said this before. I don't think I've been this brutally honest, and I'm going to be. Christ 
did not need to die to save anyone. Christ came to this planet embodying love to raise the love energy, vibration, and frequency on this material plane. His death, his martyrdom was not necessary. That occurred because we couldn't correct our vision. We were not able to assimilate the message properly enough to change that course of action. The death of his body was not necessary for our salvation. We always had that. That's what he came to teach us. We didn't need saving. We only need to see the manipulations that influence us to behave as something we are not. It is that simple. Christ was a walking example. Save a couple times, I'm being reminded. When he cursed the fig tree and it died, okay? There's human personality coming into play. Um, maybe he wasn't completely, maybe he wasn't completely awakened or enlightened at that point. Because as I understand it, it was very close in time frame to the time when he overturned the tables in the temple. Now, any one of us on a human level understand why he was angry. Yes. He was angry because we'd been deceived. We'd been manipulated. We were told what was okay by those who profited and benefited from it. We fight against each other because our faith and theirs are different. He felt all of these frustrations, and I know you can feel it coming from me right now. He felt those things. Very passionately. And at the time of his crucifixion, he was ready to be done with this experience. He, he was tired of trying to reach us, trying to help us, make us, help us understand what's always been here and we just couldn't see it. How frustrating that must have been. I listened to wonderfully well-intentioned people speak about the Bible words on the page and yet as dedicated and devoted as they are to this script script they seem to be missing the real message underneath and that manipulation was intentional and it wasn't Christ. Ask yourself who allowed these things to come into print. Ask yourself who translated these works. Ask yourself Ask yourself why Christ was really crucified. What is more likely? Is it more likely he was crucified because his blood really needed to cleanse us of our sins or because the very message he was teaching was a threat to the powers of that time?
is it possible that by saying that his blood cleansed the sins of the world was a way of justifying the act of his crucifixion, of his torture, of his rejection? Was that maybe a way of explaining making it okay somehow? It is time to start asking some serious questions. This transformation is happening. It is time to get on board. It is time to stop justifying acts of malevolence by words that sound good or by consolation prizes. Your consolation is your sins are forgiven because Christ has bled and died for you. That is a lie. Because Christ came to teach us that we are love. There is no sin in love. The sin does not come from who we are. The sin comes from the powers that have been running the show here. If a person is manipulated to do bad things, that's okay. It's okay. Don't worry about it because someone else has already taken care of your tab. No. The truth is, we are saved. All of us, even the bad ones, even the bad ones are children of God. I'm now asked to explain to you what that means, that even the bad ones are saved. We must start to question the concept of heaven and hell. We must take absolute responsibility and have 100% accountability. What that means is, if you know someone is doing harm, if you know someone is harmful, you may need to get rid of them from your life. I'm not saying to kill them or do them harm, but you may need to put on your adult grown up pants and say, I can't have anything to do with you anymore because you cause me pain and hurt. If we know them by their deeds, we have to accept that it is okay when something doesn't feel right to say no. I will not do this thing for you. No. It is okay to say no when you are hearkening to your divine spirit. Love, Christ. There are many wonderful, wonderful truths in some of the Christian teachings in the Bible itself. Can you find Christ and God there? Absolutely. But they can be found everywhere. Everywhere can be found here, here. Can be found in the air that we breathe.
where a person chooses to read, where a person is inspired to listen. God and Christ can be found there also, should they choose it. And what I will say is, if a person is seeking truth, seeking God, they are seeking Christ, whether they know it or not. It does not matter what name or label they give it. Him. If they absolutely desire truth, a real knowing. It is the same God they will find, no matter what name they give. And that is perfect. And it is beautiful. Christ taught us that where there was evil, we were to return it with good. because evil is a perception in the mind. So is good. It's a perception in the mind. Who says what is good and what is evil? You ask an evil person what is good and what is evil, and they have a totally different understanding. As do we. These are concepts in a mind. The only absolute truth is love. That is all. I have been asked to share this. This is John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That is true. Word is love. Absolute truth. They say He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. This man came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That, that was the true light which gives light to every man coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name. And this is where I must explain. In the beginning was love, and the love is God. Love is the beginning of all things. All things were made by it and through it, and nothing was made that was not from love. In love is life, and life is the light. Love is the light of life. I did a whole talk on how 
energy affects energy and how when a man and woman come together and conceive a child, depending on the energetic force that's coming together, how loving, purely loving that force is, does affect the energetic signature of that vessel that that soul is going to inhabit. Okay. John was sent to bear witness of the light of love. So John came, incarnated into a body, and witnessed of Christ, the one we know as Jesus. He spoke about the one who was coming, who was love, the embodiment of love, the embodiment of the word that could become, that could be the light of the world. Why? Because he was trying to shine the light into a dark mind. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of the light who we know as Christ. The light is Christ. The light is love. Okay. That is, love is the true light, which gives light to every man coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. Love was in the world. Love was everywhere, but no one knew it. Everyone thought they were sinful, damned, condemned people, oppressed, and living as slaves. Because they had forgotten their source. They had forgotten from whence they came. Love. Now this part where it says he gave the right to become children of God is absolutely not correct. Any who believe in Christ, not the label, any who hearken with their hearts to the kingdom, any who hearken with their hearts to love, know life. They know they are eternal. Life becomes different. We become reborn. We shed the fallacies. We shed all of those errors and all those contentions. We, we shed them. They're gone. And we know life, real life. If we live that message, if we live that truth, we can know how much fun this experience can be, how much joy we can have here. He gave the right to become children of God to those who believe in his name. It's not that he gave us the right to be children of God because we already are. But by his message, we would be aware that we are. We would remember that we are. And he brought that potential here. Who were born not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. We were already born of God. It says it right here. We were already born of God, and he was coming to remind us of who we already are. And you want to talk about crucifixion. The reason he was crucified was because he was teaching us of our value and our worth and how powerful we are. And that threatened those who wanted to have power over us. And so they wrote a story in the darkness of the mind. This said this beautiful, beautiful being had to die to save us so that we would not see what was really going on.
these darknesses removed well not really because he did teach he still teaches today but the power that he had when he walked this earth the influence that he was giving the influence he had over the people who came in contact with him was incredible he could awaken masses by just being in close proximity because his divine light, his energetic force was so powerful and so transformative. And because his love was so great, he allowed us to continue in the darkness of our minds by allowing his body to be crucified publicly. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. We are all the begotten of the Father. What is the difference? The difference is how well you remember it and how well you live it. And what that is saying is, the more of Godness, divine light, divine love you allow to filter into your body, the more influence and effect we have on anyone who comes in contact with us. They may have been better off to make us all wear sunglasses rather than masks, but they fear the word because it is, it can be very influential, this spoken word, can it? It's not the words you speak. It's more likely the energy. Why do you think they wanted us to keep away from each other? Because those of us that know the story who are not afraid just might wake the rest of them up. Because we laugh. We laugh at it because we can see. We see the game. I'm going to skip ahead to 16 and it says in his fullness we have all and his fullness we have all received and grace for grace. The law was given through Moses, the law of the world. But grace and truth came through Jesus Christ the message of absolute truth, the embodiment of truth and love was the one we know as Christ, is the one we know as Christ. Because Christ is alive. The word was with God and the word was God in the beginning before anything else was. And so each and every one of us contain the word that love, that same love that Christ embodied is inside each and every one of us. May we remember. May 
May we remember in the most challenging of times that my book, my Bible, is a pointer to truth. Absolute truth is not this book. This book points to it. I can read through this book and give you slightly different interpretations every time I read it. Because the energy of the world continues to shift. The energy of the world continues to shift and therefore the message of God, the message of Christ changes based on the need of the energies in the world. The message changes because what is needed to elevate us to the position of love? In one moment, it may be calm, peace, and silence. And in another moment, it may be a song. In yet another moment, it may be touch. The power of God is in us. And that was the message of Christ. And that was why he was crucified. The power of God is in us. That love is in us. And we can make this world anything we want. And those who would like to keep us fearful and sad and disillusioned are very threatened by the power that we hold if we know we have it. If we begin to exercise it and it does not take a gun, it does not require a weapon of any kind, all it really requires is you to know who you are. and to recognize that same God in every one of the people you come in contact with. That is all that is required to bring the kingdom to earth. Because it's already here inside of each and every one of us. We just have to actualize it and peace and love may you be blessed